Our worship on the screen. We got a rock star preacher who won't wake us from our dreams. We want our blessings in our pocket. We keep our missions overseas. But for the hurting in our city, or would we even cross the street? But we want to see the heart set Kneel. The walls fall down and our land be healed. But church, if we want to see a change in the world out there, it's got to start right here. It's got to start right here. Like the brother of the prodigal Who turned his nose and puffed his chest He didn't run off like his brother But his soul was just as dead What if the church on Sunday Was still the church on Monday too What if we came down from our towers And walked a mile Someone shoes Cause we wanna see the heart set free and the tyrants kneel the walls
check, 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 check. Perfect. All right, praise the Lord, everybody. Why don't we, whoa, hey, how you doing? I feel the power flowing through me right now. It's, it's a thundering voice. Help me. Can you balance that out, Brother Miguel? Something is going on here. It's the speaker's speaking through me. I'm not sure it's supposed to do that. Praise the Lord. Okay. All right. Let's, let's get ready to study Jesus. And uh, I do hope that you are not tired of learning about him, um, especially because you're going to spend eternity with him. So it would be, it'd be a pretty awkward thing to be tired of Jesus so early on in life. <laughs> so why don't we open up with a word of prayer? Let's ask God to help us tonight. We want to learn whatever he has for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We are blessed, God, to be in your presence. Lord, before we bless this Bible study, we pray for Israel today. Uh, they are under attack uh, from all sides right now. We are praying that you would protect your people. God, as your adopted children into this incredible gospel, we pray for Israel today, God. Let the hand of protection be upon Israel, God. Protect them from the rockets that are being launched against them. We pray that you protect them and give them favor over their enemies all around them. And I pray, God, that you would stir uh, the right countries and the right people to surround Israel with help and, and prayer. Because, God, we love Israel. They're our countrymen, our fellow brothers. And uh, I just believe, Jesus, that you're going to give them time of repentance. So we pray that today, Lord. And we pray for the blessing on this Bible study, God. Let your presence speak through me. Minister, God, truth and grace into every heart and mind. I pray that you pour out understanding, Jesus. We want to walk out of here competent and able to be more like you. And nobody can answer these prayers but you. So we come before you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. It looks like it's getting hot in Israel. So we're just, we're just praying for God to do something. Amen. All right. Well, I want to begin again. I, I, I want to help us really get back to uh, focus, I guess. Yeah. Just get back to focus. Um, two, um, two very important questions for your life are, number one, who do people say that Jesus is? You know, who has your parents told you that Jesus is? Depending on your upbringing, everybody had a different answer. And so it's, we don't think about the fact that when we walk out of these four walls and we bump into people and they say Jesus, we assume that it's the same Jesus that we were taught. But more often than not, the very Jesus that they carry in their mind is not the same Jesus you were taught. So Jesus, Jesus asked this question, Matthew 16, who do men say that I am? But then he turns it around and says, who do you say that I am? What have you been taught, and who has taught you these things, right? Now, this is important because you are going to have to be able to answer these questions if you're going to reap the benefits of Christianity. Amen? Amen. These questions are so important that they can alter your eternity. If we plan on spending eternity in heaven, heaven is only heaven because Jesus is there. If Jesus wasn't in heaven, then it's just hell. But wherever Jesus is at, that is heaven. Amen? So we're dedicating this time to learning more about him uh, because we want to know who he really is. So I want to invite you to read with me today. We'll begin in John chapter number 5, verse 39. We're actually only going to use one verse there just to kind of get us back into focus. Um, Jesus is discussing the teachings with the Pharisees, the Pharisees are those that assume they know everything, and Jesus looks at them and says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Now, I got to give the Pharisees props, and even the Sadducees and the lawyers, they at least put the effort in searching the scriptures. So, I, so I'm not here to belittle those specific people because, um, let me turn this question around on you. 
how often do you search the scriptures for the answers to eternal life? So Jesus is commending them for the effort that they have placed and the premium that they have placed on the study of scripture, the scriptures, the searching of scriptures. But then he, he drops this nugget on them that I can guarantee you didn't, didn't sit well with them. And it was this. While they were studying the scriptures because they thought in them you have eternal life, Jesus said, it's actually they that bear witness about me. So Jesus is introducing this concept that if you really want to have eternal life, then you have to comprehend the scriptures. And if you really comprehend the scriptures, then you actually know who I am. You can recognize me. Okay? And so today, with the help of the Lord, we're going to continue our journey in looking at who Jesus is and reaping the benefits of this incredible relationship that will last forever. Amen? All right, Matthew chapter number 10, verse number 1. We're going to get right out of the gate, and let's get right into what is happening in the Lord's discipleship journey. The Bible says this, and he called to him his 12 disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. Now, this is interesting because up to this point in the text, you see none of his disciples with these abilities. Up to this point in the text, you only see Jesus being the one that's healing and casting out devils and having the authority over these things and these, these spiritual dimensions. But now we're seeing that Jesus calls to him the 12 men that have shown him that they are willing to, to be more dedicated than the crowd. And he tells those 12 men, I am going to give you authority over unclean spirits, you're going to be able to cast them out. You're going to be able to heal diseases and afflictions. Now, what does this reveal about Jesus Christ? What does this reveal about Jesus' method? Like, what we're learning about Jesus right now is that Jesus develops people. He has a purpose for your life. So Jesus is not someone that's casual. He, he doesn't just meet you to meet you. He meets you to develop you. And here he is developing his disciples and now he is entrusting them with authority. Now, um, there's an old statement that says monkey see, monkey do. They just spend all of this time watching Jesus do these things and then Jesus says, now you're going to go do it. Now, I don't know about anybody else here, but I think that God is making it obvious that as Christians that are being developed by Jesus Christ, he is trying to help us develop authority in the spiritual world as well so that we can help other people. Notice how these, this power wasn't for them. It was to go serve others. Hey, go cast devils out of people. Go heal other people. Go do all of these things. Go serve is what he's saying. Now... Imagine yourself being told by Jesus Christ that you have this type of authority. Think about what you would do with it. Now, you have to really grasp this, this statement. You're talking about Jesus is telling you, Brother Matt, hey, Matt, just a heads up. Now, you, you were not able to cast out devils this whole time you were with me, but now you're able to. How many of us would be anxious to go say, well, let's go find some devils to try this on? But that's exactly what Jesus is doing. As he's saying, hey, I, I developed you with a purpose. Now I want you to go exercise this authority. Okay? Then the Bible wants us to know something very significant. In verse 2, the Bible says that the names of the 12 apostles are first T.D. Jakes. The names of the 12 apostles are first, Benny Hinn. The name of the 12 apostles are Joel Osteen. The name of the 12 apostles. Why is the Bible going out of its way to give you the literal names of the people that are Jesus' disciples? Because the Bible knew that the day would come that people 
would claim to be of a higher level than the original disciples. The Bible knew, Jesus Christ knew that the day would come where people would come up and they would use these gifts and these authorities to make themselves money and abuse and shame the name of the Lord. And so Jesus wanted all of us to know 2,000 years after, hey, just a heads up, let me tell you about my original crew. And he names them. Simon, who was called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, Theodos, Simon, the zealot. And I love how Matthew points it for us. He wanted us to never forget this. Judas is scared who betrayed him. <laughs> now, this is actually, believe it or not, this verse is fascinating to me. Because God inspired Matthew to write something permanent about Judas. He betrayed me. See, there are some things that you can do that God says that it will be written with permanent ink. That one will not be forgotten. That one will be used as future generations learn what not to do. Now, this is interesting because now here's, here's the counterbalance. We find people that have these gifts, right? We find people that have the gifts to cast out devils, heal the sick, do all these great gifts. And then what happens? We, we assume that they must have the truth because they exercise this authority. But that's not necessarily accurate because Jesus counterbalances this in Mark chapter number 16. Look what the Bible says in Mark 16 and 17. The Bible says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. It doesn't say these signs will accompany those with character. It doesn't say these signs will accompany those that are in the truth. It just says that if you have the faith to believe that Jesus can do these things with you and through you and for others, Jesus will do it. Okay? Now you may say... I'm not sure that's, that's accurate. We, we know it's accurate because if you jump over to Matthew chapter number 7, verse 21, look what the scripture says. He just taught his disciples this, and he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22, please. On, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And did we not do mighty, mighty works in your name? So, there are going to be people that say, hey, I thought I was right with you because I had the ability to do these things. That's the counterbalance. Do things doesn't mean you're right with God. Okay? That's where relationship comes in. Somebody said amen. This is, and I need you to grasp this for a second. Judas was a devil casting out preacher. Judas was laying hands on the sick preacher. But Judas betrayed Jesus for money. And this is what we're seeing in, in today's Christian society is you see preachers and pastors, prophets and so-called so professed prophets and they have abilities and gifts because they believe but that does not mean that they're right with God. Somebody said amen. Let's jump over to verse number five, please. I want you to see then what the Lord does after this. He says, these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I want you to notice this. When Jesus, when Jesus sends them out, what message are they preaching? The very same message that Jesus preached. Okay, this is stage one of their development in ministry. Okay, who sends them out? What, what do they go out speaking? What Jesus said. Okay, now, here's my question to you. If 2,000 years ago, it was urgent to inform people that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, how much more urgent is it today? The Bible says in verse 8. 
The Bible says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, you receive without pay, give without pay. Now, this is to all my anti, I don't even know what to call this type of personality, but I guess anti or atheist Christian, I guess, I don't know what to call them. Um, can you imagine, Sister Julia, if someone would have told the apostles, hey, I know Jesus told you to go lay hands on the sick, but COVID's out. I'm preaching better than you're responding. Jesus is literally looking at these guys and going, there is no sickness. There is no devil. There is no affliction. There is nothing that is more powerful than me. I'm, I'm hoping they respond a little bit better than most of us are doing right now. We are believing the media more than Jesus. And this is why we're walking around all scared. And there's some of us that are just walking around and people are like, aren't you worried about the virus? No. Listen, when God's done with me, he's done with me. The Bible says it is appointed for man to die once, then the judgment. If God is done with me on earth, I'm gone. But if God is not done with me, then I will be here. And the apostles understood this. Somebody say amen. amen. He says, acquire no gold, silver, copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, no, no two tunics, sandals for your staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In other words, God, when he, God sent out his first, his first batch of ministerial training, he said, hey, just a heads up. He said, I'm going to help you guys out. I'm going to provide the provision. Okay. You got to understand this. The laborer is worthy of his food. Now, I am here to tell you, if you are a good cook, you ought to feed me. That's a joke. You can laugh. But the laborer is worthy of his food. That's how ministers survived in the Levitical times as well as in the times of the apostles. The church cared for them so they can focus on prayer, fasting, study of the scripture, so they can be anointed when they do the will of God. Okay. And Jesus is teaching these principles, but this is just the first batch out. Look at verse 11. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. Now, this is interesting because Jesus is letting us know that there are people in our city that are worthy and unworthy. Sobering, because I want to be counted worthy. But the Bible says, as you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. I want you to notice this. Discipleship has a purpose. You may not be going from town to town, and you may not be going from city to city, but can I tell you, there are stores to stores, malls to malls, parking lots to parking lots, apartments to apartments. There are thousands of people in this city that need to know that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and that they've got to know who Jesus is. Yeah. Pastor, I don't know if this is, this, is, this is exactly what you're talking about. Sister Paige, can you show them what Jesus just got done preaching in the previous chapter in Matthew 9, 35 to 38? Look what the Bible says. Jesus went through all the cities and villages. Is he not telling them to do exactly what he did? Look exactly what he did teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. Next verse. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Next verse. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. You know what a laborer is? Brother Matt, right now you're learning how to be a, a framer, right? How, how much work is it? Brother Shannon's not here right now, but... How's that discipleship looking? <laughs> I can't believe the pastor saying you can't do this. You should do this. I would don't recommend that. Try this. Pray this. Do this. Go here. Do this. God, and, and you're thinking like, what, man, what, why can't you just let me be me? Because you, I'm trying to make you a laborer. What is God's most, what is God's most valuable creation in the world a human a soul you think he's just gonna send you out there to destroy people 
with your words and your ignorance. I mean, God is going to process you so that when you bump into a soul, you know how to handle them. He's going to make sure that you don't meet somebody on the street and you say, hey, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You need to come study the Bible with me. I already have a church. Well, what church do you go to? I go to this church. And you go, oh, okay, good. No, no, no. If you're a laborer, you start examining stuff. What kind of church is it? What do they teach? Where are their doctrines from? Does the pastor preach this? Does he preach what the apostles preach? Does he teach the doctrine? Does he teach holiness? Does he? But see, when you're not a laborer, you just assume, well, they believe in Jesus and I believe in Jesus. It's all the same Jesus. That's the difference between a laborer that knows what he's doing and somebody that just got hired off. What's that thing that they hire you off the street? Is labor ready? Labor ready. God's not looking for spiritual labor readies. God's looking for laborers. Why? Because what profit does a man have to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? All of the world is not worth one single soul. So when God sends you to interact with somebody, God is like, you are dealing with my most valuable creation. So you better learn how to, you better learn how to handle them. Because I paid for these crops, not you. Everybody just wants to, people, oh, I, uh, there's a seven-day course. I get to fly here and become a pastor. You know something? You need to get your brain scanned. Because the scripture doesn't teach that. Well, hallelujah. It's not almost right. It is right. Matthew 10, 14. Look what the Bible says. This is key. I want you to memorize the 12 names of the apostles if you can. I guess you can forget Judas if you want. This is why I want you to memorize these names. This is so important to doctrinal teaching. Look what the Bible says. And if anyone, everybody say anyone. Everybody say grandma, grandpa, uncles, brothers, sisters, neighbors. If anyone will not receive you, who's the you there? The apostles and their disciples and their disciples and their disciples. If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off their dust from your feet when you leave the house or town. Who sent them? It's not a trick question. Who sent them? And what did Jesus say that people have a choice to do? They can either receive them or listen to them, or they can't. But who is the them? Peter. Find me a chapter and verse that says, if you do not listen to Joseph Smith, I'm preaching better than you're responding. If you do not listen to John Calvin, the Wesley brothers, Martin Luther, the Catholic Pope, listen, the Bible makes no excuse for listening to those guys. The Bible says, this is what Jesus said, if you don't listen to the people that I sent that teach what I taught them, then they're going to shake off the dust off their feet. You don't think that's true? Sister Paige, give them a little bit of love here in Acts 2.37. Here's the them. Now when they heard this, they were cut to their heart, and they said to who? Peter and to the who? Rest of the apostles. What are the apostles? The guys that were just disciples. Brothers, what shall we do? What do you think they're going to say? In Matthew 10, you're being shown that they went out and said exactly what Jesus taught them. And here on the day of Pentecost, they now have been asked, what shall we do? Here's the answer. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I'm teaching you a Bible study. See, hopefully you can teach this Bible study to somebody else. What did, is there a reason why Peter's not saying to go baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? 
Evidently, Peter knew something that nobody else knew. He shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look at the next verse. Pastor, I really don't even think this is salvation. Really? Okay. For the promise is for you, for your children, all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord your God shall call. Look at the next verse. And, within, and with many other words did he bore witness and test and continue to exhort them, saying, what? Save yourselves from this crooked generation. But time out. Do you want to know why God didn't canonize the other words? Because the other words were just added to what really mattered. Which was to repent and be baptized in Jesus' name and be filled. That is what mattered and this is why he canonized it. And the other words, he said, hey, those words are great words. I'll mention that there was other words, but let me canonize what you're supposed to do to be saved. Acts 38. Now, look at verse 41. So those who what? Those who did what? Okay, so those that received the word were what? Okay, baptism is just something that you just do. Baptism is just something, it's a public profession of faith. Baptism is just something, it's not salvation. Really? Because Jesus says that when they received the word... They were baptized and went, not before they were baptized. When they were baptized, how many souls were added? How can you add something before baptism if the Bible doesn't say you're added before baptism? The Bible says that you're not even counted as saved until you're baptized. You're not even counted as, and you don't believe that? I, I don't have the verse right now, but it's okay, sister. Mark 16, 6, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You're seeing how the teachings, all they do is complement each other. They're telling you the same thing over and over again. Somebody said amen. Okay, pastor, I have a lot of problems. Every time I try to teach this Bible study to people, people just, they tell me no. Okay. I'm going to tell you what Jesus said about those kind of people. Look at verse number 15. Truly I say to you, who's the I? Jesus. It will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Now, I'm not sure you understand what be, what's being said here, but the Bible is teaching us that anyone who does not receive or listen to the words that the apostles have been taught by Jesus and have been taught to us by them, and we are teaching to others, the Bible says it's going to be a really difficult day for them on Judgment Day. That Sodom and Gomorrah is going to have more of a chance to be saved on Judgment Day than them. So I do my best to teach people this when I'm teaching them a Bible study. Hey, just a heads up, I'm not trying to scare you or nothing, but Jesus did say that if you don't listen to the words of the people that he developed himself, that you will be held accountable to that on the day of judgment. I didn't say that. That's written right there. I'm reading it to you. These ain't my words. It's his words. Somebody said amen. Okay, what's going to happen to people that are so, see, Sister Julia, I get accused all the time. You're just, why can't you just be cool like the rest of the pastors in town? I'd be cool if they would be cool with what the apostles taught. I have no problem loving everybody. I do have a problem telling people they're saved when they're not. I have a problem with you telling people to give you their money every, every week, every paycheck, every month, and you buying yourself nice things and living a nice life. And, and I'm, I'm not mad at what you're doing with their money. What I am mad is that you're telling them that they're getting something for their money that they're not. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What's going to happen to people like the apostles? What's going to happen to people that only preach what Jesus tells them to preach? What's going to happen to those kind of people? The Bible wants us to know what happens to those kind of people. Look at verse 16. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of was. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, they will deliver you 
over to courts. They flog you in their synagogues. You will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Question, because we're trying to learn what, the, what Jesus is teaching here. Why does this persecution take place? Because you're not willing to compromise. Because all you're willing to do is say exactly what Jesus said and preach his name. See, if you study history, especially if you study Christian history, what you find about Christian history is that there's only been one true Christianity since the apostles. And that Christianity has been under attack, whether it was by the Catholic Church, the Methodists, the Calvinists. None of those branches are Christians. Those are all Catholics that come from the same mother. But biblical Christianity, is a, it's its own beast. It's been under attack since the moment that Jesus died and he rose again and he poured out his spirit and the world has been trying to destroy Christianity, the real one. They're okay with this fake it stuff because those fake it ones will compromise. But the ones that stand the way the apostles say, I'm sorry, you can crucify me, but I can't preach anything but what Jesus said. That's a rare breed. Look at Jesus, what he says next. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you're going to speak or what you're going to say, for what you are going to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you that speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. What is Jesus teaching us about the day of persecution or the day of witnessing? He's saying, hey, learn how to be a willing vessel. Let Jesus speak through you and for you. Jesus is the greatest teacher and speaker. So if, if you can control your tongue and let him take control of your tongue, man, you'll do a much better job when you're under, <laughs> under persecution or interrogation. Amen? Amen? Pastor, you know, I've been taught my whole life that Christianity is this hunky-dory that you get, you know, it's a good chip lollipop, and you get all kinds of balloons and all kinds of beautiful things. Well, man, I wish Jesus would have taught his disciples that, but he didn't. You know what Jesus did? Jesus is, done, Jesus is literally telling them, hey, I'm giving you guys power, but here's another thing. You guys are going to get beat up. And then you're like, well, it's okay. I have my family. Not always, according to Jesus. Look at this. Verse 21. Brothers will deliver you over to death. Father, his child. Children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. Read this closely in verse 22. And you will be hated by all for what? For my name's sake. What is the division? What is what's, what's causing this? His name. It's always been about his name. What are we supposed to do? He that endures to the end, what? Hey, can I tell you? You better get your endurance up. And, and, and you know what? You may not like this kind of teaching because it's telling you things that you weren't expecting about Christianity, but when they start happening, you at least be prepared for them. If all of a sudden we start getting betrayed and the government turns against us and people start getting dragged into courts and people start getting killed for Christianity, say, hey, can I tell you? Jesus can look at you and say, I never told you this was going to be easy. I let you know about this persecution ahead of time. Somebody said amen. amen. Pastor, I don't think I should have to go through this. Okay, how did Jesus answer that? Verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, in other words, a devil, how much more will they uh, say things about you and your household? True Christianity will always cause persecution because it refuses to compromise what Jesus taught us. Well, you know, we just believe, you know, like the Methodist church right now and a bunch of other churches are compromising and they're allowing all kinds of weird stuff in their churches. They're marrying transgenders and homosexuals. Hey, we're not against any of those people. We pray for those people. We love those people. We want to save those people. We want to give them the truth so they can be delivered because only the truth can set you free. However... We cannot compromise what Jesus taught us. God made male and female, only male and female. 
And we have to be willing to stand on that. I don't care if you get all the scientists of the world to say that there's 72 different genders. There is no 72 genders. There's two, male, female. We have a male and a female restroom. And, and if you're not one of those two things and try to go in there, we're going to help you remember that you're one of those. In love, of course. I'm not threatening you. I'm just in love. I'm trying to calm everybody down. What's getting all? Man, I'm just over here trying to. He taught this, not me. Somebody said amen. Okay, look at Matthew 10, 26. He gets you all ready, right? Hey, Brother Matt, you're going to get persecuted. They're going to drag you into synagogues and flog you. You're going to get beat up. You're going to be hated by your family. It's going to be a rough thing. How do you think they felt hearing that? <laughs> you think everybody was like, oh, yeah, we're ready. But you know what Jesus does, brother? You know what, you know what Jesus does, sister? Jesus is not like the devil. The devil will lie to you. The devil will tell you that the world loves you. The devil will tell you that the world is fun. The devil will tell you that sin is awesome. The devil will tell he'll paint a picture for you of everything, but he'll never tell you the consequences or the price tag of what you're doing. And Jesus does the opposite. Jesus will tell you the price tag. You know, can you imagine a preacher that actually tells you that there's a price tag to live in the right way? And there's like this doctrine, come as you are, leave as you are. That's not what Jesus taught. Jesus said, come as you are, I'm going to change you by the time you're done. Simon, blessed art thou bar Jonah. And he changed his name. See, you, cut, you really get, you get discipled by Jesus, people start going, you're not like you used to be. It's the fake stuff that leaves you fake. Somebody say, help us, Lord. All right, now that he told them all the flowery stuff about Christianity. What does he do next? This is what Jesus does, okay? And I want you to learn his personality because this is his personality. After he tells you all the bad news and he has you, he, their blood pressure's rising and the thoughts are starting to move in their head and they're starting to sweat because they're thinking like, oh man, it's about to get bad. What does Jesus say in verse 26? He says, have no fear. <laughs> so have no fear of them for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Look at what he says here. This is very powerful in verse 27. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. The Bible just answered the question why Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. He is answering that question with the scripture. The reason Peter said what he said is because this is what Peter heard whispered to him by God. Peter was there in John 5, 43, when Jesus said, I come in my father's name. He was told that the name of the Messiah would be Jesus, where he will save his people from their sins, Matthew 1, 21. He was there when Jesus said in 14, 26 of John that the comforter will be sent in my, in, in, in my name. So he, he was taught what it actually meant. So when he was asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, hey, let me tell you what Jesus told me. He never told me to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He told me the name of the Father. He told me the name of the Son. He told me the name of the Holy Ghost. And that name is Jesus. And that's why they baptized in that name. Hey, I love his name. I don't know if you love his name. I love his name. What the Bible says, verse 28. Then he gets to our flesh. And do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Hey, Jesus, scare us quiet. Come on, preacher. You just hide in your little basement in your chonies and record videos all day. Forget about lay hands on the sick. Forget about walking into danger. Live a comfy Christian, charismatic, comfort life in your little basement, afraid of everything. Can I tell you, that's not what Jesus taught his guys. 
You're reading it with me. Jesus told them, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, baby. I'm putting you in harm's way. I'm going to put you around leprosy, so you better have the faith to heal it, because if not, it's going to get on you. Yeah. Oh, welcome to the real Christianity. Hallelujah. But I want you to notice this is incredible. Look what the Bible says. He says, don't be afraid of those that can kill the body, but be afraid of him. You know what Jesus is teaching us? Hey, don't be afraid of the world. You need to be afraid of God. What's the worst, what, you know, what's the worst that COVID can do to you, Sister Krista? Kill the body, but it can't send you to hell. Hey, what's the worst that persecution can do to you, Brother John? They can kill the body, but they can't send you to hell. But you know who can? Jesus. And so I would rather take the risk that he tells me to take, knowing that I win. You cannot let the world scare you silent. You have, to be able, you have to be willing to stand even when everyone else around you bows. Somebody say, help us, Lord. And then he wants to tell us, he tells us why that this is important. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Are not one of them, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are numbered. For us guys that are losing hair, that's special right there to us. <laughs> Brother Mandela, I don't know how many hairs I'm losing every day, but God does. And I don't know how many are growing back, but he does. And I don't know when they're falling off, but he does. Can you imagine that? Look what he says. Fear not, therefore you are more valuable or of more value than the sparrows. You know what God's telling you? Hey, I got you. You're valuable. You really think that I'm going to put, you, you think I'm going to do you dirty? No. It's not how I roll. I take care of the sparrows that are worth a penny. You think I'm not going to take care of you? For all of you that struggle with insecurity, Jesus just said you're valuable. And that should make you happy. I'm almost done, I promise. Notice how the scripture, okay, remember what Jesus said? The scriptures testify of me. Watch this, Matthew 10, 32. And I can't get to everything today, but it's okay. We're going to get through some of this. Look at this. The Bible says, so everyone who acknowledges who? Who's the me? Before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Who are we supposed to acknowledge? And the question then is, what constitutes acknowledgement? To what extent do, do we have to acknowledge them? It, baptism is one of them, but it's actually, watch this. Somebody, uh, this local church that rents from us here, they, uh, they have a saying for us. They call us the Jesus-only church. They call us the Jesus-only church because other churches are open to doing things in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but we're exclusive. We only have one that we serve. We serve Jesus. But I had to teach their pastor a quick little Bible study a few months ago, and I had to say, hey, sir, we're not a Jesus-only church. We're a Jesus-everything church. And there's a difference. There's a difference between a Jesus-only and a Jesus-everything church. Colossians 3.17 teaches us this principle. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in what? What happens when you do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus? You're giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. So we're a Jesus everything church. You know how disrespectful it is? To not use the name of Jesus on baptism? It is a slap to Jesus' face because this is what you're doing. You're saying, Jesus, I'm willing to use your name when I am trying to invoke a healing. And I'm willing to use your name when I'm trying to cast out a devil. But you know something, Jesus? I just don't want to take your name on baptism. 
That's pretty disrespectful if you ask me. You only use him for his power, but you won't let him be Lord of your life. See, when you agree to baptism in Jesus' name, what you are saying is you are saying, I am willing to die and let him become Lord. See, everybody wants a Savior, but nobody wants a Lord. Oh, I love Jesus. He died on the cross for me. He's my Savior, but is he your Lord? The Lord can tell you what to do, when to do it, why to do it, how to do it, not tell you why, just do it. The Lord has control over you. When the Lord says, hold your tongue, you... Lord says, don't do that. Don't go there. See, that is true lordship. But see, people don't want a lord, they want a savior. Because people are willing to see somebody else pay for their sin, but they're not willing to submit themselves to the one that died for them to get them out of sin. I'm telling you, Christianity is, it, it's a thing, folks. Somebody said amen. amen. Sister, give them verse 34, because this is, I had a conversation with somebody recently, and they tried to rope me into, like, this pastor's association in Spokane, and I said, the only thing I'll do with the pastor's association, you guys are just going to get mad at me. I'm pretty sure you guys don't want me in the same room as you guys, because I already know what's going to happen. You guys are going to talk about Jesus. I'm going to tell you the Lutheran Jesus is not the Bible Jesus. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic pastor. I don't care if you're a Catholic pastor. Give me the real Jesus. Well, I'm a, I'm a Methodist. I don't care. That's not the real Jesus. I want the real Jesus. But why can't we all just get along? Why can't we all just be united? How come we all can't? We all serve the same God. It's all the same Jesus. Oh, no, it's not. No, 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 no. There's a different Jesus. The Bible calls him another Jesus. I thought Jesus came, Sister Julia. I was a new convert, you know, I was ignorant to this stuff because, you know, all the, all the charismatics tell you, like, come on, we all got to get along, man. Like, it's all about love and kumbaya and Jesus and positive vibes, bruh. And then I bumped into this little verse here that kind of just blew that theology away. Because this is Jesus talking. Look what he said. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. This is Jesus talking. Jesus is saying, I didn't come here to bring peace. He said, I've come to bring, I have not come to bring peace. He says it twice in the same verse. But what did he say? What do you use the sword for? You divide stuff. Stuff. You poke stuff. You fight stuff. Jesus said, I don't you. This is what he's telling his disciples. Somebody once told me, Pastor Jesse, I just wish you would tone down and calm down a little bit. And everybody would be, you know, they'd love you a lot more. And I'd say, hey, I'm sorry, but Jesus didn't come to bring peace. He came to bring a sword. You're either for him. Or you're against him. You either love him or you don't. Jesus never said he came to do kumbaya. He came to bring a sword. What is the sword? Hebrews 4.12, what does it say? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged. You wonder why we bust out the sword when we talk about Jesus. Who's your Jesus? Well, I, I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I think he's, he's the Jesus that my pastor said. Who cares what your pastor said? What does the sword say? It gets a little more difficult here. You ready? Oh, all right. I got time to actually go through this. Praise the Lord. Look at this. It gets a little more difficult here, brothers and sisters. Verse 35. For I have come to set a man against his father. I just got done preaching on honor your father and mother, brother. And Jesus said, Jesus said, I've come to set a man against his father. And I've come to set a, a daughter against her mother. And I've come to set a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And Jesus doesn't have to do that. That happens naturally. 
That's a natural one. When Jesus is like, I didn't even do that one. It happens all the time. Look at the next verse. And a person's enemy will be those of his own household. Look at the next verse. Whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Yeah, nobody told you about this type of Christianity, huh? I was always taught, Brother Matt, growing up, going to these little churches, you know, floating around. I was always taught that. When I thought about Jesus as a kid, I thought Jesus was like Santa Claus. You know, if you ask, you'll get it, and uh, everything's good. I didn't know it was this intense. Look at the next verse. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now, look at the next verse. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I'm going to ask you a quick question. I need you to be honest with yourself for a second. How many churches have you gone to that are literally telling you, hey, Christianity is not easy. Christianity is work. Christianity has a price tag. Christianity is painful. There's a joy at the end of it, but can I tell you, Christianity, it takes work. How many altar calls have you been to where someone's telling you, Jesus is preaching to people, and, and he's telling these people, hey, you're not worthy of me unless you're willing to suffer with me. You're not worthy to follow me. You're not worthy to be mine if you love other people more than me. Maybe, may, okay, once again, maybe I'm the only one that has experienced this, but I've I like to visit churches undercover. I'm an undercover church hopper. And I do this because I like to sit in the back and I like to watch how they manipulate the minds and the emotions of people for money. And I'm like, man, I'm sitting in the back and I'm like, man, I even feel good. Like, I want to like, man, this is cool. Pastor's like, you just go. I'm telling you, no matter what you're doing, God's okay with it. God loves you so much. It don't matter what you do. God's always going to forgive you. God loves you so much. It's all going to be okay. And I'm thinking like, okay, I am trying to figure out what Bible he's reading out of. Because I'm reading about a different type of Jesus that says different things. But he, once again, this is how he closes this incredible thing. Verse 40, please. Just enough time to finish with Jesus' closing statements. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. You know what happens, Brother Matt, when you, re when, you know what happens when you receive Brother Tori? You receive Jesus. Because Jesus Tori was carrying the right doctrine. See, when people, when people shoo you away because of what you teach, they don't realize you're not shooing me away. You're shooing Jesus away. You're shooing, you're shooing the truth away. You're, you don't want what Jesus really said and what he really says and expects. And Jesus says, whoever receives you receives me. You are the most valuable asset in the entire planet to the Lord Jesus Christ. If people don't receive you, they are literally refusing Jesus. At least the Bible, Jesus. And look what the Bible says. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. The one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Whoever gives you one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Now, I'm going to try to help you understand how important you are and why you talking to people and you going to places and you talking and sharing the gospel and you teaching Bible studies and you outreaching and you, you talking to your neighbors and you being at the park and saying talk something to somebody. I, I, I'm going to show you. You are giving people the opportunity 
to be blessed. What was the promise that he told Abraham, Brother Victor, in Genesis 12, 1 through 3? I will bless them that, and I will curse them that. What did Jesus say to his disciples if they don't receive him? That Sodom and Gomorrah will have a better time on Judgment Day. But, but what did he say about people that receive them? They get rewarded for it. Brothers and sisters, Christianity is about developing us. Because Jesus sacrificed his physical body on the cross so that we can become his members on earth. He gave us his body so that he is able to use our body. So when we are received by people, you don't even realize, when someone invites over for dinner, you don't even realize what you're doing. When you show up to that house, if they treat you kindly, if they treat you nice, God is going to bless that home. I better get a lot of text messages here in a little bit, but coming over to you. God will bless you. God will bless. I'm telling you, this is why when we bring evangelists, and to visit like the Claibornes, I say, hey, have them over. Hey, have dinner with them. Hey, have a cot. Why? Because I want you to get blessed. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. Let's stand tonight. Now, I, I hope I can say this and you don't take it the wrong way. I like to be real, and so I, I hope I can tell you this and you not take it like, man, this pastor's carnal. Brother Matt, when I read this stuff about Jesus, let's just say he wasn't my first choice. I didn't know it was going to be this tough. How awesome would it have been if he would have just said, Matthew 10 and 1, I've given him authority over unclean spirits, but he never told him any of the other stuff. And Christianity would be rolling, baby. Everybody would be like, man, I want to be a Christian. But he said, no, there's a price tag with this. And you got to know about it. Jesus is showing us his character by the way he talks to his people. Jesus is showing us how he deals with his people. Jesus is showing us his character by not embellish. Hey, did anybody, did anybody discern any sugar on this? This was not sugary, folks. If I was sitting right there, if I was sitting that day hearing Jesus say all this stuff, I'm like, no wonder Jesus is like, brother, there has to be a better way. <laughs> but here's the reality. You have, to, you have to come to terms with, will you accept who Jesus really is and what he really says? Or are you going to continue to live in a fantasy land with a Jesus that never died, that never came, and never rose from the dead? That's a choice that we all get to make. And I want to help you make that choice based on the real evidence that's been given to us by him. Amen? Amen. I want to have a real relationship with him. Would you... Would you pray with me that God would take what he taught us today about him and he would help us, man, he would help us see it and with a positive spin or something because, man, that was some heavy stuff that he said today. Let's pray. Father, we need you because, wow, I cannot imagine being there with those 12 disciples here in these teachings. You just got done saying, Lord, that I got to pick up a cross and follow, that I have to be willing to lose my life for you, that I have to be willing to do everything in word and deed for you. You just got done telling me, Jesus, that there is a very good possibility that there is going to be persecution given to me. God, you just revealed that it's going to take work and prayer and fasting and endurance to be able to endure to the end. Lord, I pray that you would help us today because we are trying to have a real relationship with you. I don't want to have a fake relationship with you where I only read the positive life radio verses, but I don't go ahead and dive into the scripture and see what you really said, how you really behaved, what you're really about, what you really expect. 
No, sir, when I say I love you, Jesus, I want to mean it because I know you, because I've studied you, because I've searched the scriptures and learned about you. God, I want to be more like you, Jesus. I need your help because I cannot do this in my human power. My carnal mind is enmity against you. My carnal mind does not want to do what you say, live the way you say, teach what you teach. God, my flesh wants to make this easy. My flesh doesn't want to hand out the cross to people. But the scripture says that all of us have a cross to bear. All of us have a cross to carry. All of us have a price tag to pay. And God, I pray by the authority of your name that you would give me the wisdom and the understanding to operate in that revelation. I want to be a Christian, Jesus. I want to be a Christian that has biblical genetics, that has a biblical reference point that could point to chapter and verses for what we believe. I don't want to fake it, Jesus, only to realize I didn't make it. I want to be a real Christian, God, that learns what you really said and when you said it and who you said it to. God, I want to be a Christ-like person in this world. I want to be a blessing to our society, God. Jesus, I want to show them who you really are. I don't want to be mean or harsh. I want to be honest and transparent. I want to give them the truth. Because, Jesus, you said I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I want to give them you, Jesus. I want to give them who you really are. I want them to be able to say they love you. It's impossible to say you love somebody without knowing who they really are. God, you're revealing yourself to us right now through the scriptures, and I pray that our hearts are open to love you. Help us work through what we don't understand. Help us learn to meditate and chew on these teachings so that we can apply them to our life. The harvest, Jesus, is plenty, but the laborers are few, and I pray that you would turn every one of us into an effective laborer. Because I want to be a blessing to you, Jesus. You are so good to me. You deserve my best. Lord, you don't deserve my leftovers. You deserve my best. And I want to live my life in such a way that when the trumpet sounds, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God, I want to live my life in a way that when you look down and see me, you see a reflection of yourself on me. God, I want to be like you. I must decrease, Jesus. I must die daily. And you must increase, Lord. Be who you are, Jesus, and do it inside of me. Lord, bless every single person that heard this lesson. Lord, I pray that you would give them a spiritual reality check with this text and help them, God, study it and see that these are your words, not mine. Lord, I love you and I thank you for the opportunity to share your truths. Bless your people in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Folks, I really do hope that you, you'd spend time studying what Jesus is teaching us because I want you to really know him. I enjoy getting to know him, even though he confuses me a lot. <laughs> Amen. Hey, shake somebody's hand and let them know, hey, I'm glad you're